Hey everyone, it's 5.43 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, July the 2nd, and the year 2019, we're told. Don't forget, I've put up on the schedule that this Sunday at 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'll be having Chip Wilman on again. Um, <clears throat> he's, so far, he, uh, the working title of his presentation is a chronologist and it looks like it's going to be pretty interesting so please join us then it had to be at 6 a.m eastern standard time because of where chip lives if it was any later than that eastern standard time it would be putting it pretty late into the night um, for him so when i have guests on you know at a different part of the world and you know the time would be inconvenient for them I try my best to, to shift it to a time that's that's gonna work uh, you know for them and myself so please join us for that that's the first thing um, the second thing is uh, as I told everyone uh, within the last month that I really don't want to continue uh, for too much longer being affiliated with YouTube now I'm I'm quite aware uh, because I've been looking at all the other uh, video um, sites and programs there are out there uh, platforms and and really nobody has anything yet that really rivals what YouTube has as far as exposure and features you know it it certainly is uh, for right now the Rolls Royce of uh, video platforms uh, however that's still uh, that still really doesn't excuse uh, a long-term continuation of an affiliation with them that's really just going to cause me to either have to self-censor or they're just going to continue censoring me and it's it's going to get worse than that you know they're them and and other platforms they're gonna start using local so-called laws about speech to uh, just say well we're applying that to our platform um, and you know specifically in America um, when they start passing laws against speech uh, I would think that that would be enough to wake a lot of people up and and shake them a bit out of their their sleepy comfort zones and show them who's really in charge you know first off it should show them that we have uh, a foreign occupying uh, government uh, hiding within the guise of a free country um, I don't know of a free country that exists but that's what we have it's it's not an overt government it is a covert occupying government so and and when you see things like you know 550 congressmen you know voting with one voice together to make quote-unquote anti-semitism uh, illegal or hate speech and uh, the uh, the very broad sort of definitions they use and and how ambiguous it all is um, to give them what they think is the right to tell people that certain things they say they can't say um, the thing is it's just that YouTube being owned by Google is leading the way in that I don't see YouTube repenting of that anytime soon so I just don't I, I don't necessarily see the point of continuing on with such a a, a dark uh, entity as YouTube has become um, however I have looked into just about everything I know of that's out there um, and yeah, everything I, I produce on YouTube is pretty much automatically uploaded to 
bit shoot for right now, except for my live presentations. They're not. I, I have to manually uh, put them in other places. Um, I just received my uh, my excess storage uh, from uh, a friend uh, here on the channel, and I'm going to be setting that up, and that will allow me to 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 store a, a lot of material that I don't really want to lose. That's going to take some time to do, and then deciding what video platform I want to use is going to take time too. Um, the best thing that I found right now uh, is probably library. Library is in their beta stage. You can use library by an app that you just download. And right now that app is really similar to the way that uh, um, those file sharing programs used to work like 20 years ago, I think, like iMesh uh, and Kaza. For right now, just because they're in their beta stage and and they're really open, you could you can download that app and the things that you find on there that aren't um, you you don't think are really great or that are going to work you know too well or whatever, you can really easily send them an email and they get right back to you. Um, and I, they're currently really changing it in so many ways, trying to make it as accessible as possible. It seems like they're probably the best bet out there um, for creators. And I'm not saying that they're not run by people who are already uh, controlled up or in the pockets of, of you know, uh, quote unquote, the enemy. I'm not saying that. I don't know. <laughs> um, but there aren't too many video channels out there that offer too much. Uh, BitChute can be extremely slow uh, to upload things, and that's unfortunate about BitChute. Um, Archive is really great. It doesn't have those, uh, those big delays on uploading video or audio. However, Archive and BitChute are oftentimes um, not available um, because the internet service providers will say that they're, you know, in violation of local laws and things like that, and they'll just make them unavailable for a lot of people around the world. So what I may find myself doing is actually moving to a podcast format. Because right now, podcasts are far less policed. There are so many of them, and there are a lot of people that are um, developing their own home sites to host podcasts. And those home sites are essentially providing a sort of protection uh, of, of these people where they can speak their mind and not have to worry about being bullied um, out there in general internet land uh, like a lot of other people. Uh, one of the sites that's doing that is like uh, Radio Aryan um, and there's one other and their name escapes me right now um, and that's good but in general, um, when I started uploading the podcast, and I was only going to make uh, that series, Mormonism is Judaism, the podcast that I was uploading to um, Anchor.fm. The thing is, I would only be uploading that podcast the way it's looking right now every few months, because that's literally how long it takes for me to read the amount of material that I have to to try to put together those presentations. However, if I just did a regular podcast, that part of it, the Mormonism is Judaism, could be presentations along the way with other things in between. Now, 
there might still be some presentations that absolutely have to have video with them. Um, and that would be the reason that I would still reserve a channel on a, a video platform, let's say like library. Although library is really hoping to develop into something a lot like archive. So it would have um, video files, audio files, text files, so on and so forth, probably very much like archive.org is. A library of as many possible types of mediums you know as you could imagine so we're gonna see how that develops as time goes on and I will keep you all informed as we go uh, today I'm gonna keep talking about hiding America and how not only our history but very much our geography um, is so much different because we can follow clues from one, two, three, four centuries ago, reset theories aside, uh, and see that this place was far different to the people exploring it, experiencing it, and writing about it uh, just two centuries ago, in many cases, one century ago. Uh, and you really find a very foreign place if you can find the writings of honest men uh, from three, four centuries ago. Uh, however, it seems that most of the publishing houses of the world have been run by the same sort of people for many centuries now. So it is difficult to get this material unredacted, unedited, um, uncensored. I have a Wikipedia page up right now. The Wikipedia page is on a tribe of people from North America called the Mandans. It's very unfortunate because if anybody was looking into the Mandans, most of the pages they're going to pull up are going to show a people that look like and dress like and seem like most of the other Red Indian tribes in the Dakotas. This is unfortunate because the Mandans of a few centuries ago were nothing like the other Red Indian tribes of the Dakotas. And we're going to see that <clears throat> through a bit of the writings in the journals kept uh, during the Lewis and Clark expedition. Um, in fact, not only Lewis and Clark, but there were others who went and found the Mandans in North Dakota. Um, and I'll give you an idea of where they they were they were near <clears throat> what is I guess today it's um, where they said they were staying now there is a Fort Mandan it is a replica it is not the original the story behind that is that they say that Lewis and Clark said that when they came across their fort that they had built in the Mandan's territory on their return journey that it had been burnt down. Now, was it burnt down or did they burn it down? I don't know. It's near a, a place called Washburn, North Dakota. And what's weirder about it? Because nothing of their civilization exists anymore. Now what's weirder about it is that it is just where they say the Mandan civilizations were because they had various sites along the Missouri River uh, in North Dakota that they uh, stayed, that they had uh, stationary, stable villages at. Just to the north of this, uh, 
is a place called Riverdale, which was the headquarters uh, for the Army Corps of Engineers when the Army Corps of Engineers was building the Garrison Dam. The Garrison Dam, essentially, as far as anything I can see and read, and when you just look at a map, you can see in, in a map as you follow a river, you can see oftentimes where a dam was built because there's going to be slack water. And, and what we have is this gigantic area of slack water that makes up these different lakes. Now the areas around these lakes um, has all been taken over by various park, U.S. parks and forest services. Isn't that interesting that we see that as a, a common occurrence especially in areas, places that are questionable, like say we would want to know a lot archaeologically about the Mandans. Well, as far as I'm concerned, it looks like the area where the Mandans lived uh, and perhaps had many more structures than were even written about in the Lewis and Clark uh, journals, which of course were heavily redacted. And by the way, one of the biggest gaps in Meriwether Lewis's journal was during the time they were with the Mandans. So what we're going to see as a pattern is first off the Army Corps of Engineers absolutely refacing the land with rivers and slack water lakes they did it in my own hometown to the river that ran through there and they entirely changed not only the topography but the, eco the ecology of an entire gigantic area of land and river so, in fact, this site is still managed by the Army Corps of Engineers. This whole area, I was so surprised as I went to find out how many areas are still controlled to this day by the Army Corps of Engineers. And how often they have diverted rivers and created all of these slack water dams and <laughs> the the opinions concerning the efficacy of hydroelectric power are really varied. Um, these don't necessarily do really great things for the ecology of a land in general. Um, so here we go again, their pattern of uh, refacing this entire country and in my opinion hiding the country that was here the lands that were here and the civilizations the advanced civilizations that were here doing their best to hide that and they have many tentacles that they are using to do this and many techniques um, we're going to see later one of their techniques is literally to bury things and as I told somebody in one of the comments um, interestingly enough, I never mentioned this concerning those caverns or caves in the Grand Canyon. It's actually said that they, that area is, uh, guarded by, um, special, uh, U.S. armed forces, armed guards, uh, who I'm sure have a certain, um, level in their security clearance this is not a job that they would be talking about I am told that that is highly rumored that that is the case and of course that makes me wonder about a large number of deaths that occur in natural parks if people are getting off the beaten path and stumbling uh, upon places that certain entities don't want them seeing 
and if they are just another name, uh, that ends up in uh, another David Polites book, I suppose. But that's all speculation. That is all speculation. And while I'm thinking of it, I have to correct something I said in the first video in this series concerning uh, supposedly the federal case where there was a judgment rendered against the Smithsonian. I had somebody bring that up because they had went looking for authentication and they didn't find any. So I went and tried to find it and I couldn't find it either. That may be a contrived story. Uh, I could find no hard evidence, no case numbers, nor the court that it was in that that ever happened. Which, that, to me, sounds more logical than there actually being any kind of judgment at all against the Smithsonian. That makes far more sense to me, because I was really surprised about that. Um, I had come along that story from a, I believe, a blog, and didn't realize the source of that story was a site that is known for putting out bogus stories, and I think that they're probably a controlled op site. So, I would have to say that that's probably uh, bogus. So, I'm sorry about that. I don't always have time to vet everything. Uh, and sometimes, I should take a little more time to think about some of those things uh, before I come out with them, because what makes sense is that there would never be a judgment against the Smithsonian at the federal level. That makes sense. And usually if it makes sense, that's, that's usually the direction you want to go in. So we'll find out as I read through uh, some of the sections. Uh, I'm still reading from the same book, which is uh, The Suppressed History of America by Paul Schrag and another guy whose name I don't remember because it's, uh, it's really... An odd name and hard to remember. Anyways, we're going to find out why the Mandan today uh, appear to be just the same in uh, their genetics, their dress, their culture, and everything else as the other Red Indians. And, and I'm going to have to say that because I don't yet have a good... Uh, set of, of terminologies for the people who were here, dwelling here, the inhabitants of the Americas um, in the 1400s, 1500s, when the Europeans started uh, recording experiences with them. Um, you know, forever they were called Indians before they started to be called Native Americans. And then, of course, that didn't have enough... Um, that didn't have enough weight and strength for the people who would politicize this or use um, really bogus ideas about them to control the narrative in one way or another. Uh, then it had to shift from Native Americans to First Nations people. It's ridiculous. Okay, we're talking about the inhabitants of the Americas around the time the Europeans started recording um, interactions with them. This is not around the time that people started coming here. People have obviously had to have been coming and going from this land from the start. You can't miss the Americas. You literally can't miss them as a sailor. You can't. You can put a raft out in the ocean, in the Atlantic or the Pacific, and those, uh, those natural streams within the oceans are going to carry you to the Americas. You can't miss them. And nobody ever did. That's why untold tons of copper are gone from from upper michigan and who knows how many centuries it took to extract all of that uh i just recently found a i don't know if it was it's a short book or a long paper 
about all of the mining done throughout the ages along the shores of Lake Superior. Yes, there, there is a cornucopia of evidence in North America, in Central America, and there's a lot in South America that civilizations, and in many areas, quite advanced civilizations and very different people types, lived here long ago. And in the case of the Mandans, not that long ago. The Mandans, well, we'll see if we get enough description uh, for you here. Um, I'm going to start by quoting from uh, an author by the name of Gary Malton, who does say that uh, it is difficult to explain uh, Meriwether Lewis's lack of journal keeping once the expedition got underway. Uh, no Lewis journals are known to exist that cover the first phase of the exposition, expedition from May 14, 1804 until the group left Fort Mandan on April 7, 1805. That is almost a full year that he left out and he's being, he's being paid with U.S. government money. And one of the things he was being paid for was to keep a very accurate record of his travels. It is unexcusable. Um, if I were in charge of commissioning this exploration and they got back and the head of the expedition had nearly a year of time, um, not just in pockets, but at one time, from May 14, 1804 to April 7, 1805, with nothing, nothing journaled, um, they would be getting a serious reduction in pay. Because it, that's not doing the job he was hired to do. So most of... Uh, the material on the Mandan is going to be uh, read from chapter 5 of this book, which is entitled Prince Maddock, Welsh Natives, and Legends of the Mandan. Um, I'll start at the beginning and, uh, and see how much fruit that offers. I may have to bounce around in here because... I've covered a lot of this in my own readings, but remembering where all of the good juicy bits are is a whole other story. <clears throat> uh, it begins, During their encounter with the Flathead, or Salish, Indians, on September 5, 1805, while in what is today western Montana, members of the Corps of Discovery, which is what the group of Lewis and Clark was called the Corps of Discovery, noted that the natives spoke a strange tongue. Sergeant John Ordway observed, quote, these natives have the strangest, strangest language of any we have ever seen. They appear to us as though they had an impediment in their speech or brogue on their tongue. We think perhaps that they are the Welsh Indians. Unquote. Clark noted in his journal that only the flathead or the Salish tongue was, quote, a gurgling kind of language spoken much through the throat, unquote. Ordway was certain the Corps had discovered the legendary Welsh Indians descended from Welsh Prince Maddock, who had sailed to the American continent centuries before Columbus. As the stories go, in 1170 CE or AD, a Welsh prince named Maddox sailed west, far away from the disasters occurring in his homeland. Bards throughout the next four centuries did the same. The earliest printed report of Maddox's story is David Powell's The History of Cambria, published in 1584. Uh, from it, uh, he quotes, Maddock, 
left the land in contention betwixt his brethren, and prepared certain ships with men and munitions and sought adventures by seas. Sailing west, he came to a land unknown where he saw many strange things of the visage and returned of this mattock where oh there be many fables as the common people do use in distance of place and length of time rather to augment than diminish but sure it is that there he was and after he had returned home and declared the pleasant and fruitful countries that he had seen he prepared a number of ships and got with him such men and women as were desirous to live in quietness and taking leave of his friends took his journey uh, thitherward again maddock arriving in the country into which he came in the year 1170 left most of his people there and returning back for more of his own nation acquaintance and friends to inhabit that fair and large country went thither again gutin owen the famous bard and historian of basingwork abbey is one of the most influential proprietors of the maddock myth his writings are cited as crucial sources by authors such as richard deacon who wrote the influential Maddock and the Discovery of America in 1966. This rare book builds a solid case for Maddock's voyage of discovery, despite controversial claims that Maddock's story was invented after 1492, giving England claim to prior rights in the New World. Deacon's research indicates that in 1625, the Archbishop of Canterbury wrote a world history that suggested a Welsh prince had discovered America. What if the young Prince Maddock lived on to build ancient settlements and interact with the Native Americans? The ocean current naturally would have carried Maddock and his fleet into the Gulf of Mexico. Once there, he would have been attracted to the perfect harbor offered in Mobile Bay. There's another traveler the ancient bards speak of who also sailed to American shores. An Irish monk named St. Brendan was said to have discovered sometime between 512 and 530 common era or AD, an island so big he failed to find the shore after forty days of walking in a forested land full of fresh fruits and divided by a river too wide to cross. His tales, first published in Latin, were fanciful bestsellers that read more like great entertainment than actual reality. St. Brendan's exploits were quickly synchronized with folklore, and he joined Maddock as another mythological hero. In 1977, historian, author, and ship captain Tim Severin proved the voyage from Ireland to North American mainland was possible. Against all odds, Severin and his robust crew built a leather boat exactly like those used in the days of St. Brendan, and sailed across the dangerous Atlantic Ocean, safely landing in Newfoundland. There have been ancient fortifications found along the Mississippi River with architecture unlike any previously discovered in the region. And let's not forget all of those tribes of giants spoken about by the Spanish explorers along the Mississippi, tribes that had all kinds of gold they wore. In 1781, in a 1781 letter, Governor John Seaver of Tennessee recounts a conversation he had with a 90-year-old Cherokee chief. Seaver asked the chief about the people who had left the fortifications in his country. The chief told him white people who crossed the great water had built them. This letter can be found in the files of the Georgia Historical Commission. There are three major forts that stand out against the typical native settlements found along the Mississippi. 
All three of these forts share striking similarities to ancient Welsh fortifications. The fort at Chatsworth, Georgia is virtually identical in layout and method of construction to Dulwidellen Castle in Wales. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that Dulwidellen Castle in Wales, the supposed birthplace of Prince Maddock. As forts were built in territory expanded upriver, a clash with hostile native tribes was inevitable. It's presumed this hostility forced them to build a defensive stronghold, complete with a massive wall 800 feet long. The wall, another anomaly of southeastern archaeology, long predates the Cherokees found living there in the 1700s. Cherokee legends called the wall builders... <laughs> moon-eyed people who were said to have fair skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes. Throughout the centuries, scholars and historians have argued for and against the Maddox story. And if I can uh, add my own opinion here, I mean, we have, we have many pretty solid stories of Scandinavian sailors coming to North America. Uh, there's a number of quasi-solid stories of, of sailors from Asia coming to the Americas. There are quasi-solid stories about natives from uh, Indonesia building rafts and literally floating to islands uh, off of South America simply by using um, the natural streams within the oceans. Those are the highways. Sailors get in those highways, and they use those highways. The winds are not always going to be with them and take them wherever they want to go. They use them as their highways to get places. The oceans were never a barrier. The oceans were always a highway. Now, one thing we're going to find is that various Indian tribes, or maybe I should just say tribes, just tribes, Let's, let's get this idea of the red man out of our head. Okay, let's just say tribes. because, And the reason I say that is that's what the modern narrative wants us to think. They want us to think that this was a land of quite similar red men. Um, but it wasn't. It was a land of diverse people. There were a lot of different kinds of people here. Now, the thing about these authors that's similar with a lot of other authors is I believe that they believe, and so they're transferring this belief to us, that whites came from elsewhere to North America, Central America. Uh, however, one thing that cannot be proven is that whites weren't he just here uh, long before a number of other people um, that are called Native Americans or First Nation people. Um, and something I haven't even gotten into yet are the Clovis points, which prove that whites were here, well, of course they date them, you know, 10,000 years ago. Um, let's just say a heck of a long time ago. There are many artifacts and a great deal of evidence like the uh, Caucasoid mummies found in Florida and I'm going to get into Kennewick Man um, probably on the next video or you know quite soon. Another Caucasoid. They're uh, there's quite a lot of evidence of early Caucasoids living in North America that have slipped through the fingers of the people typically trying to hide it. And when you see the controversy around Kennewick Man, you can see the, um, the serious, uh, visceral lengths they are willing to go to to if they can't cover up these finds uh, to bury them or to do everything they can to discredit them. Um, 
Now this is all important, and I know I'm already at 40 minutes. I don't know if I'll make this part in two. You know, we might talk about the Mandans and basically Caucasoid people in the Americas over a, a few installments of this because it's uh, there's a lot of material. Uh, but they continue, in November 1953, a memorial tablet was erected at Fort Morgan, Mobile Bay, Alabama, by the Virginia Cavalier Chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution, which reads, quote, In memory of Prince Maddock, a Welsh explorer who landed on the shores of Mobile Bay in 1170 and left behind with the Indians the Welsh language. The memorial, subject to much controversy, was taken down after a hurricane in 1970. Despite resolutions being passed and the support of the governor to restore the plaque, this part of American history is mostly forgotten, covered up, or transparently ignored. More than any other tribe, the Mandan of the Northern Plains showed signs of contact with Welsh explorers such as Maddock. Now this is where we get into his opinion on how they came to be there and how it is that they were as they were. He continues, they were a small peaceful tribe that lived at the convergence of the Knife and Missouri rivers near Bismarck, North Dakota. They were known for their friendliness, which was the outward expression of a deep-seated ethical philosophy. Or was it genetic? Now, this is where we get into a uh, part of, let's just say it's a part of my worldview I have not concreted yet. But I believe there is much that many researchers, scientists, um, there is much material out there and much to be said for the genetics of a people. Consider what Richard Kelly Hoskins says when he says that um, white Christian man is the product today of the law of a thousand generations of the law killing murderers and rapists and punishing thieves and so on and so forth so that genetically we have actually gotten rid of the deviance over the year through keeping the law of Yahweh or God whereas other peoples pagan peoples who have other gods do not have that law and and oftentimes um, are rewarded for murder and thievery and rape and so on and so forth so whatever you want to think about genetic components like as a certain person of a certain race <clears throat> just genetically disposed to a certain behavior and which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Is that because they were always genetically predisposed to this behavior? Or is it because these various peoples have not had the law so that they could weed out the perverts and the deviants in their societies with the law? And we have. And that's the reason that we have and have had civilizations, most uh, white Europeans, civilizations that have offered so much goodness to the world for quite a long time. Not perfect, but civilizations using the laws that Yahweh gave our forefathers to create a man that was genetically better because the murderer, the rapist, and so on were put to death 
and their genetic seed was taken out of the pool. And that can have such a great effect on what kind of a people in general you end up with. So I'll continue. The Mandan shared the northern plains with tribes such as the Hadatsa, Arakara, Asini Bowen, Dakota, and Chippewa. The lands they collectively inhabited were largely similar and had few natural barriers to prevent the mingling of people. Because of this, the various tribes had many traits in common. They all depended on buffalo for food, clothing, and other necessities. I don't know how that's a trait. They, they all hunted. Okay. But of these, only the Menden and Hidatsu lived in earth lodge villages when they were first visited by white people in what is now North Dakota. The Menden were further differentiated from their na native counterparts, their native counterparts, in the way that they set up their villages. They were differentiated from other peoples around there. In the way that they set up their villages, their spiritual beliefs, and their physical appearance. These differences have led many scholars to suggest that the Mandan derived from different bloodlines than their Northern Plains counterparts. Despite a widespread absence of facts about the Mandan in history books, <laughs> how weird, there is more than enough documentation elsewhere to suggest that the tribe originated in Europe. Maybe. The Mandan lived in Earth Lodge homes, and that's what we're trying to get past. This idea that Europe was the birthplace of white folks. We don't know that for a fact. We know that for a long time, Europe has been um, the, <laughs> forget about the cradle, um, the mainstay of white civilization for a long time now. But we don't know that that's the only place that whites were or originated, so on and so forth. Now, if whites are the Israelites from the Bible, or if at least a certain amount are, then it couldn't be in Europe. I've searched Europe high and low to see if it will match up uh, to the lands described in the Bible, and it just doesn't. Um, I searched the UK quite a bit. And I also believe it doesn't. It doesn't offer the geographical features that a land needs to offer for this to occur in. The problem I've got with Palestine, besides the fact that geographically it doesn't work, um, there are certain aspects to it that work. On a superficial level, it works. But when you get into the details, it just falls apart. The other thing about it is when you consider the environment of the Middle East and the Levant and Egypt, this is not an environment well suited for whites. So for all of you who are, are very much of the opinion and the belief that whites are the Israelites of old, you need to ask yourself that. You know, the thing is, a lot of Jews, who a number of Jews are quite similar to European whites in a lot of ways. Some aren't, some are. There's kind of a big spectrum there since there's kind of a lot of various different sorts of people that self-identify as Jews. However, there are a number that are quite a lot like white Europeans. And you know, most of those people don't like living in Palestine. One reason is the the weather, the type of land, it, they're not suited for it. <clears throat> Our skin is not suited for it. When I lived in Florida, I can't tell you the number of skin cancer cases that I saw every day because you've got all these people with the wrong kind of skin living in the wrong kind of environment. You see, not good. And there's a lot to do with the way that people are built and how good they function in different environments. Whites function far better in 
temperate environments and specifically in the north. <clears throat> so I'll continue on. The Mandan uh, lived in earth lodge homes rather than teepees. And unlike the settlements of other tribal nations, theirs were permanent. They didn't roam around. This was permanent. The women of the Mandan tribe tended their gardens, prepared food, and maintained the lodges while the men spent their time hunting or seeking spiritual knowledge. Their villages were strategically located on bluffs overlooking the river. This position provided maximum defense and limited any attacks to one land approach. These villages were the center of the social, spiritual, and economic lives of the Mandan. The Mandan earth lodges were unlike those built by other tribes. These lodges were large and rectangular and circular huts 15 feet high and 40 to 60 feet in diameter. Each hut had a vestibule entrance and a square hole on the top that served as a smokestack. Each earth lodge housed 10 to 30 people and their belongings. And when you consider the dimensions of these lodges and 10 to 30 people, in my estimation it's almost like if we were looking at apartments that would have anywhere from four to eight units and a central area where they would do common things in. That's the way I would perceive this. I, I don't think you have to have a lot of imagination or stretch what you're seeing here to perceive it as such. Villages contained 50 to 100 earth lodges. The frame of an earth lodge was made from tree trunks, which were covered with crisscrossed willow branches. So basically, they're using posts and purlings. Over the branches, they placed dirt and sod. So, good insulation. This type of construction made the roofs strong enough to support people on nights of good weather. The floors of earth lodges were made of dirt and the middle was dug out to make a bench around the outer edge of the lodge. Surrounding the village were stockades of poles as tall as six feet high to prevent enemy attacks. In the middle of the Mandan village was a large circular open space that was called the Central Plaza. In the middle of the plaza was a sacred cedar post that represented the, quote, Ark of the First Man, or, quote, Lone Man, a revered hero from their ancient legend. At the north end of the plaza was the medicine or ceremonial lodge. The arrangement of the lodges around the central plaza represented the social status of each family. The higher in status villagers were the, the more duties were required of them, and therefore they were located closer to the ceremonial lodge. A strange feature of the Mandan villages uh, that did not correspond with the behavior of other native tribes was that the Mandan homes were arranged resembling streets. The Hidatsas, another peaceful tribe, were the only other native people who built earthen huts, which practice they learned from the Mandan. The rich floodplain fields that surrounded the village made agriculture the basis of Mandan existence. The Mandan women were responsible for sustaining the gardens within the village. The agricultural year began in April when the women would clear the fields by burning the old stalks and weeds of the previous year's crops. Around May, they planted rows of corn, beans, tobacco, pumpkin, 
sunflowers, and squash to maximize exposure to sunlight. To tend their gardens, women use tools such as digging sticks, rakes, and hoes made from wood or buffalo bones. To protect their gardens from natural predators like prairie dogs, birds, and rodents, the women constructed scarecrows out of buffalo hide. The Mandan women also performed daily cleansing rituals before entering their gardens by rubbing sage on their bodies. They believed this would protect their crops from worms and disease. Harvesting began in late August with squash and ended in October with corn. After harvest, women would dry the corn in scaffolds built above the ground. After the corn was dry, women picked the seeds that they would use for next year's crops, and the rest was buried with other dried uh, garden items in underground storage pits to preserve them through the winter. These garrets took days to build and were deep enough to require a ladder to enter. When finished, they were lined with grass and buffalo hide. The dried vegetables and seeds were placed inside. The garrets were then covered with a layer of buffalo hide, a layer of dirt, then grass on top. In comparison to the traditions of other native tribes, these techniques impressed white traders and scouts as uncharacteristically advanced. Well, yeah, they were making the equivalent of root cellars. These were agrarian people. They had that in their blood. That's one thing that whites have just in their blood is that agrarianism. It's something that, you know, the folks occupying Palestine don't have in their blood because their ancient, ancient, ancient ancestor was cursed from the land. That's why you don't find them farming. That's why even a guy like Henry Ford, who believed they were the tribe of Judah, he marveled over the fact that they just didn't farm, couldn't farm. He said, oh, well, they'll own dairy farms or cattle industry, and they will. But farming? No. And that goes back to their oldest ancestor. Why? It's very easy to find out. You read Genesis 4. Uh, let's see. I'm getting close to an hour here. Let's just continue a little more here. The most mysterious, mis <laughs> the most mysterious mysteries, <laughs> the, the most mysterious of the Mandan characteristics was their physical appearance. Unlike other natives encountered by early explorers, the Mandan were purported to have a mixed complexion that varied from white to almost white, whatever that means, blue and green eyes, and reddish or blondish hair color. All these characteristics suggest European genetics. They suggest? No, they outright scream European genetics were at some point introduced to the tribal bloodlines. Okay. Now, let's think about this for a second, because these guys just have it stuck in their head that Europeans had to come there and introduce their genetics to, let's say, red men, as opposed to these were Caucasoid people who perhaps their ancestors had lived in this land long before, quote-unquote, red men. And that along the way, they had, their children had, for a long, long, long time, at various times, maybe taken a spouse from those other peoples around them and, tr and introduced into their bloodlines um, genetics from other tribes which almost without a fault, would have had darker skin, darker to black hair, darker eyes, so on and so forth. It is very, very easy to um, 
<clears throat> breed European features out of people. Those other genetic features tend to dominate very quickly. Um, in fact, the fact that many of them were white, or what they say almost white, again, whatever that means, and had red and often blonde or blondish hair, tells me that they had maintained over the years most of their Caucasoid or European features, which means they probably did not interbreed with others that often. Now, <clears throat> the other thing we don't know is how much of the opinions of Lewis Clark or others that kept journals were tainted um, due to politics. And I think there's a there is just a ton of politics behind this Lewis and Clark expedition. I don't even know how much this Lewis and Clark expedition wasn't just for show, to be some kind of authentication um, of a mapping and fact gathering, let's say expedition that probably wasn't needed. We don't know how much of this wasn't just for public consumption, let's just say. Um, I really have to wrap up at this point just because I've got so much uh, going on. But I will continue uh, next time right where we're at in this chapter continuing to talk about the Mandan if we wrap up on the Mandan very quickly then I will probably go on to the Kennewick man or talk a bit about Clovis points and again some of those theories that people it seems like they just got stuck in their head after a lifetime of being told over and over and over again that white men just had to uh, spawn f uh, in Europe just because that is in the modern day where we see most of them at. Me personally, I would expect based on uh, climates and the intelligence of whites and how much we see them traveling throughout the ages that we ought to see um, plenty of whites in America. Now, there may be uh, pretty good reasons why we would not see as many for a very, very long time. And then suddenly, within the last few centuries, see the largest migration of any people from one place to another in all of recorded history, which is what we experienced what we saw in whites migrating from Europe to North America. So until next time when I pick up on the Mandan, um, I wish everyone very well. Bye.